Hej och välkommen till att vara sammen med oss i öppna dörrar en liten halvtimme. Stå stark i stormen är ett begrepp vi brukar i öppna dörrar. Idag så ska du få veta lite vad som ligger bak det stå stark i stormen. Vi har besök av en gäst från Kanada, Jim Cunningham. Welcome to Norway, Jim. Thank you, Lena. Good to be here. We have been, I've been blessed by the visit uh, already. It feels very much like at home in Canada. Because this is your first time. My in first time. I live out on the west coast in Vancouver, which is very much like Norway. It has rain and green. <laughs> <laughs> yes, rain so and green, and that is what we have here that's as what well. That's you have here. Uh, you, you are very familiar with the word standing strong through the storm right. and first i have to say you have been uh, connected with the persecuted church for more than 40 years right so what happened it all for me it began back in the 80s 1980s um, i was invited to help open doors take bibles into another country where the bibles were restricted and um, we did my wife and i took uh, two suitcases of Bibles and two friends who spoke the language that we were visiting. Was it in which part of the world was that? Uh, it was in Spanish part. Ah, oh, okay. I guess I can say that it was into Cuba because it was 1980. But uh, it was, uh, we visited pastors there who um, were experiencing a different type of persecution. They weren't being put in jail for their faith in Jesus Christ but they were being restricted in how much they could share uh, the gospel in public or they couldn't build new churches uh, if their congregation got too big. So they came up with the idea, hey, let's start a church service on a different night in the same building and then on another night and then on another night. And soon they had church services going five nights a week. So and actually there were a lot of uh, believers in Cuba at that yeah, time yeah. and it was growing. And it was growing and it still is. It's still growing. They've, uh, the, the, the country economically has had challenges and difficulties, um, but the church has continued to grow. So that was my first introduction, actually, to Open Doors with Brother Andrew. And then later in the 1980s, uh, I was invited to go into China, and we were in Tiananmen Square just a few weeks after the, the conflict in Tiananmen Square with the university students. And it became a, a, an opportunity. From there, we went into, took Bibles into the Soviet Union. And then uh, we've, we've taken them into many, many countries with, with open doors back in the 80s and the 90s. And then as things started to change, the request came to open doors to help believers in countries where they were being persecuted, not by an atheistic government, but more by a uh, other religion and a religious government that didn't want Christians in their country. So Christians have been experiencing persecution in many regions. Mm -hmm. So Open Doors worked with a variety of uh, countries and I've had the privilege and the honor of going to them. That brought me to this mm -hmm. particular book of SSTS, the, mm -hmm. I, you'll have to pronounce it in Span in in Norwegian. Uh, Norwegian. Stark i stormen. All right. Is in English, we just call it the standing strong through the storm. But so, but just let me con so. conclude. Uh, what you did first was bringing Bibles yes. to several countries. Yes. And actually, that was uh, uh, the beginning of uh, Open Doors. It was bringing Bibles for those that who didn't have. That was the key have. thing. And then this book did not exist at that point. And then what would happen when we visited these pastors in these countries and leaders, we'd say, how do you survive when there's persecution? How, like, what? how do you do it? I mean, there's persecution against your family and against your church and against your faith. And, you know, how do you survive? And they would tell us what how, how God helps them. So we would then say to them, if we could take you to Canada or to Norway and put you in a church, what would you tell Canadians to do to support, to be aware of persecution, to understand it, to prepare for it, and how to respond to it. And they told us, and as they told us, we wrote that down, and that became a book, which is now in 
50 languages mm -hmm. around the world. So that's how it got started. That mm -hmm. was our first. And that was you together with a very good friend of yep. you. Paul Esterbrooks was mm -hmm. the was work. He worked with Open Doors. At that time, I was teaching at a Christian university in Canada. So I, I was at a university. He was the staff member. And he sent me a copy of the first copy, uh, first edition, and said, edit this for me. Well, I, I read it, and, and I studied it, and I said, you need a teacher's guide to teach it. He said, good, you write it. <laughs> so we wrote it, and then that led to the invitation to go with him to teach this. The first time I did was in uh, Indonesia in 2001, just after September 11. I, we went in November of 2001 into Indonesia. Mm -hmm. I can, that's another story I can tell as well. But that's, mm -hmm. that was how it all started for me. So actually it has been more than 20 years now with uh, this theme um, to educate and support the persecuted church yep. how to stand strong. So yep. this is one of our, actually one of our main um, tasks it 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 has become it, it has been used in as i say in 50 different languages mm. even more countries have used it than that and what we've been privileged to do and honored to do is to go in and train the trainers who are then going to teach but i i i do i have to t tell one funny story okay we went to teach this course in a country that ends with the letter stan s-t-a-n mm -hmm. We won't tell which stand. That means Central Asia. Central Asia. So it was one of those countries. And we get there, and there were, there were 18, 17 pastors gathered, and they did not have this book yet. Um, and we were going to teach the course. And they said, oh, we're sorry, we cannot find a translator who can speak English and can speak our n local language. So we hired a translator who speaks English and Russian because this whole Central Asia all spoke Russian. Mm -hmm. So she, she is going to teach the Russia, the, in Russian. Well, what we discovered was she was not a Christian. She did not know the Bible and she didn't understand what we were talking about. And if I said... I'm going to quote Galatians 2.20. She would go, what's a Galatian? <laughs> so we thought, uh-oh, we got in trouble. But these, we taught the course. And we thought, I don't think they understood very much because her Russian and our English, we're not sure that she even understood what she was translating. Five years later, five years later, we're in another part of Central Asia. We're, tra we're training people from eight different countries. And a group came from this country that we'd been at with, her name was, I'll call her, I'll give her a name, I'll call her Larissa. So Larissa had been in one country. Five years later, a man arrives, a young man arrives, and he says to me and to Paul, he said, you don't know me, Paul or Jim, but you know my mother. And we went, your mother? Yes, my mother was Larissa. And we went, Larissa, the one, the, the Russian translator who wasn't a Christian? Yes, she came home. She said, I learned more about the Bible in one week with those two men than I've learned in my whole life. She went out and bought a Bible. She taught the family. I became a Christian, my father became a Christian, my brothers and sisters became Christians, we all became Christians, and now they have sent me here to learn how to teach SSTS. Wow. <laughs> oh, that is that, fantastic. It was. It was it was an exciting moment for us because we thought we thought that was a failure. Yes. And, and then it was a divine it, appointment. Divine from appointment. God. Yep. Yep. We love those. <laughs> we want more of those. <laughs> more stories. <laughs> more stories, God's yes. yes. Okay. Mm. Um, I'm just thinking about you traveling around to these countries yeah. where people experience such hardship because of their faith. Mm -hmm. It could be that they are, have been in prisons. Uh, and 
beaten, outcast in the society, whatever. Mm -hmm. What gives you authority to come and teach uh, them how to stand strong in the storm? Good question. Uh, while you are a Western, yep. living this good life. The good life, yes. It's interesting you, you would ask that question because I, I was asked that question in my own home church before I ever went. My first trip out was to Indonesia to teach. And w I have many, there's a, I go to a large church with a number of pastors and one of the pastors came to me and said, by what authority do you go and teach persecution? You've never been in jail. You've never been beaten. You've never suffered for your faith. How do you, you have no authority. And I thought, whoa, that's pretty, pretty strong language, you know. I, but didn't somebody ask Jesus that too? By what authority do you do, you do this? Um, the whole idea was the authority that we had to do it wasn't from our authority. The authority was from Scripture. I said, we are teaching what Jesus, we teach what Jesus teaches in the scriptures about persecution. And he does. He teaches in Luke 6. He teaches in Matthew 10. He taught his disciples about persecution before he had experienced any persecution. He taught them about persecution before they had experienced persecution. But he said, this is what's going to happen. Men are going to hate you. They're going to exclude you. They're going to insult you. And they're going to reject you. And you're going to be persecuted because if they persecute me, they will also persecute you. So here's how you prepare for it. So Jesus prepared his disciples when he hadn't experienced anything yet. He was still hadn't he hadn't been hmm. experienced. Later on, they tried to push him over a cliff and get rid of him when he was in Nazareth. Later on, they they crucified him and persecuted him. But when he was teaching his disciples about persecution, he had not experienced anything yet. He was mm -hmm. saying, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't speak from my experience because I know uh, Alan Yuan in China and visited in his home. I've, I met him, in a, I've been in his home. Mm -hmm. He spent 21 years and mm -hmm. eight months in prison mm -hmm. um, because he refused to join the government church. Well, I, I have never been in prison, but I can tell his story. Yeah, yeah. You didn't teach him before he went to prison. He, I didn't. You didn't teach him. Uh, no, 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 no. But you met him and you heard his story. Why, don't, why don't you just let us get to know him a bit? Alan Yuan? Yes, and yeah. he's, I know he has a wife as well. <laughs> he, he does, he, uh, and six children. Mm -hmm. he, he was 44 years old. I don't know how old the people are watching on this program, but I'm sure there's a 40-year-old out there that's watching that says 44 years old. He was the pastor of a church, and he was told by the government, you must register your church with the government. We No more children in your church. Your sermons have to be approved by the government. Um, they came up with a whole bunch of regulations that, that he had to follow. And uh, Oh, he was told he could no longer preach about heaven because that gives people a false hope. And he couldn't preach about hell because that scares people. So he w there were certain things he couldn't preach about. So Alan just calmly looked at the government official and he said, no, I can't do that. And they said, well, you'd better do it or you go to jail. And he said, no. He said, um, the church is a bride prepared for the coming bridegroom, uh, Jesus. And it's the church is not... Uh, a harlot to work for the government. So they said, okay, you're going to jail. 21 years and eight months in jail. His wife, Alice, didn't know whether he was dead, alive. She didn't know where he was for 21 years, eight months. She looked after six children and had her mother-in-law, Alan's mother, lived with them. Mm. I think and away they went. I think often we, we can remember those who are in prison. Yep. And we forgot about the wife, the wife back and home the family. and the family. Yep. And God provided miracles for that wife and family, for Alice. I mean, she had one night no food left. She prayed with the children and said, we'll trust God because there's no food left. And uh, the next morning, 
little tap at the door at five in the morning, five thirty in the morning. She goes and there's a lady standing there with baskets of for her, and she said, "Are are you are you Alice Yuan?" And Alice said, "Yes." She said, "These are for you." I had a hard time finding your house, and she looked at the lady and said, "Who? What is your name? Who are you?" She said, "I have no name," and disappeared. And they opened up, and there was food for a month in the baskets. And money underneath the food to last for six months because she had no money. She had no source of income. God provided for the whole time. And those six kids, the last I heard, they're all still serving the Lord because Alan got out of prison at the age of 65. I've met them, met the father and the mother. And uh, the he got out of prison when he was 65 years old. Came home and they said, you are incorrigible we can't change your thinking so you're on probation from 65 to 75 and so he couldn't start he couldn't have a church he couldn't go back to his building so he made little cassette tapes with a microphone and handed it out to friends and they went and played the tapes and others heard his teachings and became followers of Jesus Christ and said we want to we want to be Christians we want to be Christians and follow accept Jesus Christ and Alan said well that's great, but I, 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 can't, I can't leave my house to teach you. They said, well, we want to get baptized. And he went, I'd love to be able to baptize you, but I can't. So he figured out a way, though. He, he was smart. Yeah, because he was not allowed to organize He wasn't allowed to, have organize a, anything. To, to do any organization, to have a building, to have a church, congregation, members. So he organized what they called the Allen Yuan Family Picnic. And he rented. He told. He registered with the government. He's going to have a family picnic at the river. Three hundred people showed up, <laughs> <laughs> and he baptized three hundred people in the river. The police showed up. The police said, "Who authorized this?" And they said, "I have a permit for the Allen Yuan family picnic." Well, come on, you have three hundred people. This is not your family. He said, "Oh yeah." They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. So he was bold until the day he died. He was in his 90s when he died, but he kept doing it once a year, would baptize all the new believers. He mm. said, I baptized more people after I got out of prison than I did before mm. I went to prison. Yeah. So and, and he kept his faith yep. through all those years in prison. Yep. Did he share his experiences with you? Mm -hmm. uh, how... He, he managed to be, be fresh in his faith through that. He, he, he did, he, he made some, see, he was working nine hours a day in prison, six days a week. He worked nine hours a day in heavy labor. Okay. And then he had to have re-education classes because he was, he was viewed as an, an enemy of the state and his wife had to have re-education classes. And um, he said, he was very much alone in prison. There, the, there were no other Christians in the prison where he was. There was one, um, yeah, there was maybe, he said maybe one other person. And he said he had no Bible for 21 years and eight months. He had no Bible. So he said, tell Christians in countries where they have Bibles to memorize Scripture because you get into some prisons in some countries, you don't have a Bible. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I only had the verses that I had memorized. He said, I had no hymn book. He said, in those days, we used to use hymn books. And <coughs> he said, I, I had no hymn book. He said, I only remember two hymns. And one was the old rugged cross. And I'm not going to sing it because I'm not a musician. <laughs> but on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. He said, I sang that for 21 years. That was the only song, hymn, the only hymn they knew. The other one he knew was a chorus that was called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And he would, and every time we went to his house, he with a group to introduce, he would tell us, he would sing them for us. And I Have Decided to Follow Jesus, No Turning Back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. And he kept, he was faithful right till the end. 
So basically, I can come back to Canada or to Norway, and I can say to Christians in, the, in our countries, we don't have that kind of persecution today, but we have to have the same strength of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, that he is alive, and keep serving him. Don't turn back. Mm. It, it could get difficult here, too, mm. or where I live, but keep going. Mm -hmm. And that's all I can say. Just keep going, you know. Keep going. <laughs> keep standing strong through the storms. Mm. That's what it is. Mm. Can I borrow that book? This book? You may. Uh, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Jim. And I just want to, uh, ja, jeg vil bare si til dere som ser på at vi har denne boka på norsk, og nu har vi også utarbeidet et kursmateriale på norsk, Stå stark i stormen. Gå til vår hjemmeside og se litt på det, fordi at vi trenger å stå stark i stormen her vi bor, og vi møter alle på forskjellige typer stormer. Guds ord gir oss guidance, eller leder oss til hvordan vi skal gjennom, og eh, den boka som eh, Jim eh, sammen med sin venn Paul Østerbrook har skrevet, er en stor oppmuntring og hjelp til det. Til oss her, og til våre søsken som blir forfulgt for sin tro. Gud velsigne deg. Vi markerer det at folk faktisk får høre om det som skjer, for det er veldig mange som lider og synes det blir snakket for lite om generelt, så det er veldig gjerne å stå høre om det. My name is Ahmed Aouni. My name is Jana Hazer. I'm Emil Azar from Aleppo, Syria. My name is Kukaro Loué. Joseph. Nathalie Massar. Peter Issa. Lita Kouni. Sylvia Gamal. Wasim from Iraq. Fadi Ghanem, I'm from Jordan. Arrabu ra'iya fala ya'uzuni shay. Fi mara'i khudrin yurbuduni. Ila miyah rahati yuriduni. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path. For his name's sake, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We are the church.